It's Wednesday morning. I hope you guys are having a good week. Sorry, my phone is not wanting to stay in its little holder this morning. We're going live with Sonia Mercer this morning, y'all. She's a great friend of mine and I love her dearly. Her husband is actually the one who officiated our wedding. So that's exciting. Good morning, Audrey. Okay, I'm gonna hold this for just a second and see if I can get her on. Let's see if, I, if it'll let me. Hi, Summer. Hi, Audrey. I'm so glad you guys are here. Oh, there she is. Okay, I'm inviting her. Teresa. Good morning. Hi there. Hey friend. Hi. Hey, you're sideways. Just that you have to turn it long ways, which is on Facebook Live. There you go. One second. I'll have it. Okay. That's better. <laughs> That's better. Okay, wait a second. We'll have it completely done. There we go. Is that better? Yes. How are you this morning? Great, great. You? I'm good. So good. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, wow. I was interested you before you came, but if you could tell us more about yourself and your church and, and what you do and who you are, and then you can just jump in. Okay. I am Sonia Mercer. I am from Cornerstone Church in Wheeler, Texas, married to my husband, who is the senior pastor for 19 years and um love doing what we do so and um, are you ready for me to start yes to start? okay perfect you know i'm gonna just kind of talk about the life of david and and how david throughout his life was overlooked he was discounted for who he was and that he was the youngest and just the different things that he looked at and um I'm going to stay over in First Samuel 6, chapter 16 and chapter 17. And so I'm going to start with the prophet. When the prophet um, Samuel went to Jesse, because God told him, he said, listen, I want you to go to Jesse's house and anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. And so he goes, and what happens is one by one, the the Jesse brings out his sons. And so the first son comes and he says, Jesse in his heart, he says, this is the one, this is the one that is supposed to be, look, he's handsome. He's big. He's strong. He is the one. And God said, no, you look on a man's outward appearance, but I look upon his heart. And that's what I want to say to, to everyone out here today is, you know, the fact of the matter is, is God looks upon our heart. It don't matter what we come from. It don't matter who we've been, what we've done. He's looking at our heart. Does he have your heart now? That's what he's looking at is our heart. And so anyhow, one by one, then, then what it happens, Jesse brings one son, no. The next son, no. The next son. And so it gets where we've gone through all the sons. And so let's pick up in chapter 16, verse 8. It says, then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the field watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark, handsome, and beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. You know, he was overlooked by his own dad. He, he wasn't significant enough to bring him into the meeting. He was out in the fields, tending the fields. And so maybe you've been someone that has been overlooked. You need to know that God does not overlook you. He does not call you insignificant. He does not overlook you. See, one of, uh, see the one that everyone had overlooked, God had set apart. He said, this is the one. This is the one that I want to anoint as king over Israel. See, in my own personal life, there has been many times that I've been overlooked, that I've been considered in, insignificant. And that's exactly what they did. They counted David insignificant. How many of us has felt insignificant in our lives? 
See, the greatest struggles that I've ever faced is trying to overcome insignificance. My dad had a motorcycle wreck when I was um, 10 years old, which has been left him in a coma for 27 years. He just passed away um, three years ago, this coming New Year's Eve. And um, you can imagine, my mom had suddenly a 15-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a six-month-old that she has to raise. And um, the depression and the struggles, they were real for my mom. And she turned to alcohol. She became, she became an alcoholic. And in becoming an alcoholic, what then ended up happening is um, – is she got where she wasn't able to take care of us to the ability to the same level of what she had been and so by the age of 14 i began to struggle with drugs and alcohol myself and um then my grandma who had lived with us from the time i was three years old and after my dad's wreck she was the only source of stability in my life at that point and what ended up happening is the day she passed away i ran away and I was just, or the night that we that she, we buried her was the day that I ran away. And I was gone for a few days. And when I came home, things very quickly, they escalated. And my mom and I, it became very physical. And I beat my mom. And she said this was it. I was never allowed to live back in her home. I had, So I moved in with this family in French. And at that point, I had regrets. I had, I had made bad decisions and the attack of the enemy, I felt like there was nothing else, that there was nowhere else to turn. I had been dealt a bad hand. That's how I felt in life, that I had been dealt a bad hand. I had told my mom many times I didn't ask to be here and um, I had struggled. And at that point, depression had set on a 14, 15 year old girl. So anyhow, so I felt that this was the only way that I was going to be just like my family. But the truth is, is God had plans to prosper me. He had plans to give me a future. He had plans to give me a hope. The way I had figured out is that I'd live with this family in Fritch for these few months during the summertime. And then I'd go live back with my mom and my dad, or my mom. But I didn't expect that summer I'd go to summer camp and I would encounter Jesus. I would encounter him. It, a radical transformation would take place. And so the truth is, is my darkest moments are now just moments in time. They don't define who I am. And so I don't care who you've been, what you've done, what has taken place in your life. Those darkest moments can only be moments in time. They don't define who you are today at this moment. And if it's somebody that if you're living through this right now, it don't mean that this moment has to define the rest of your life. It's just a moment in time for you. Do you have anything, Madison? On that? I, love that. I love that because I think all of us have experienced seasons of insignificance. Even if it's just, you know, a day or, you know, a month or some of us have have experienced years of where we just feel insignificant like god do you care anymore are you here are you near and the truth is, is exactly what what you said and what the word says is that he does care and he is Absolutely. here he plans to prosper you and not to harm you and and that even in those moments that we do feel insignificant we have to stand on his truth i love that yes keep going great that's great well let me let's fast forward into david's life real quick now we go over to, to chapter 17, and Goliath, he's taunting the Israelites. Remember that? And so he's like, choose a man today whom you're going to send out to fight me. He's talking to King Saul and all the Israelites. He says, send out a man that's going to come fight me. This huge giant over nine foot tall, send a man out that's going to fight me. If he wins, we will be your slaves. But if I win, you all become our slaves. And so over in 11, verse 11, it says, when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Wow. They were terrified and deeply shaken because of this man. And so then you go over and you see where Jesse's got three of his oldest sons with King David on the battlefield, with King Saul on the battlefield. And he says to David, he says, David, I want you to go over and I want you to take some food and some supplies. And then I want you to come back and give me a report. I want to know what is going on. And so he gets over there and David 
leaves his things with the keeper of supplies. And he hurries out to the ranks to greet his brothers. And while he is there, David, Goliath shows up. And what does he begin to do? He starts taunting them. And so it says that all the Israelites uh, army heard this and they begin to run. They begin to flee. They were afraid for their lives. Fear, true fear came on them. But David did not run. He stayed right there. And what did he begin to do? He started asking the different men. He said, now tell me, what is the reward for the man who kills this giant? And so then he, he would hear from this one, and then he would go to the next one. Now tell me, what is the reward for the man that kills this child? And he goes from one to the next. And his brother, his oldest brother hears in verse 28, and it says, But when David's oldest brother heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. See, once again, when we try to step out to be who God has called us to be, the devil will use someone or something to tell us that we are insignificant, that we are not good enough, that we are unqualified, that we are overlooked. David was the youngest of eight and a little shepherd boy. Once again, he was overlooked. His brother overlooked him. Who are you? You're to be tending the sheep. Why are you even here? He was overlooked by his own family, by his brother. So first it was dad. Now it's his brother. See, this is how I felt. I come from this family that is that is full of poverty and that struggles with drinking and with drugs and dysfunction. How can I ever be anything more than this? You know, the truth of the matter is, is statistics say you're going to be just like your family. But that's not what God's statistics say about me. That's not what God says about me. That's just what the world's statistics say about me. And that's how I felt. But not only had I felt, I had many people, people throughout my life, throughout teenage years, that I would be nothing. I'd be just like my mom. I'd be a dropout. I would be on drugs. I would be pregnant before I was out of high school. And I had those things spoken over me time and time and time again. But that's not what God said about me. He had, he had plans and a purpose to prosper me in a, in a bright future. And so that's what we have to look to. What does God's plan say about you? Not what the world says, not what you've been raised under, not what you've seen, not what's been modeled before you. But what does God say about you? And he does not overlook you. He accepts you. And so what amazes me, this did not stop David. He kept asking the questions until Saul heard, and he summons David. He said, get David, bring David over here to me. And so when he gets to Saul, I love this part. David, don't wait for Saul to start talking to him. David says, he says, I'll go fight him. Don't worry no longer about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. David knew who he was and he knew who his God was. And I find that incredible because he's been overlooked by his dad and now his brother right in the midst of the battle. And he says, I will go fight him. I'll take care of this for you. But here it goes again. And he's being overlooked in verse 33. And it says, don't be ridiculous. Saul replied, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. He was overlooked by the king, by the, the one of greatest authority. He had been overlooked. Sometimes, even people in our own life, people that's been placed in our life, people of authority, bosses, parents, leaders, sometimes they will overlook us. We cannot be shaken. We cannot be moved. We have to know who our God is and that he created us for greatness. You were created for greatness. I was created for greatness. Do you have anything? Oh, my gosh. I just, I love that. I love that so much that, yes, even these people, even, you know, it doesn't talk about Saul's heart for David or anything like that, but people who even have a heart for us, our parents, our, you know, these leaders, our teachers, who do have a heart for us and their heart could beat, you know, 
that we do grow up to be this person, but just in a moment of weakness, say something or do something that that is trying to diminish the call of God in our lives. And the truth is, is that we have to know who God says we are, regardless of what anyone else is saying, and stand on that always. Love it. Yes. yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Let me pick up in verse 34, chapter 17, verse, 1 Samuel 17, verse 34. It says, but David persisted. So see, now the king has said, you're just a boy. Come on. And David persisted. It says, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this both to the lions and the bears. I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. He knew who his God was and he knew he would be delivered. He knew that his God would deliver him. And so what does David do? He don't, Saul says, okay, well, here's all this stuff. Here's this, this, all this armor. And he's like, no, I can't do that. He completely relied upon God. And so what does he do? He picks up five smooth stones. This is a huge giant. I mean, come on. When I think about killing a giant, I don't think about using five smooth stones, but that's exactly what he did. He picks up five smooth stones and, a sl and he grabs a sling. And he goes out to the battlefield and he sees Goliath. And it says, Goliath is insulted. What am I, a dog that you would send this boy out to fight me? He's just a boy. And so what does David say? I love this part. It says, David said, you come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. defiled today, today. The Lord will conquer you. He didn't say, I'm going to conquer you. He didn't say, I'm going to take this sling and I'm going to sling it into your head and then cut your head off with your own sword. He says, today, the Lord is going to conquer you. He knew who his God was. He knew the battle was God's. We have to understand that God fights our battles for us. Even when we've been overlooked, forgotten, he fights our battles for us. We don't have to fight them. He fights them for us. In verse 48, it says, as Goliath moved closer to attack, David ran out quickly to meet him. I love that part because he did not walk. He did not retreat. He did not run like the rest of the, the Israelites when they seen him and in fear. He began to run at Goliath. In verse 49, it says, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with a sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone, the stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell and fe face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone where he had before. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. We have to understand God is for us. Who can be against us? We cannot lose. We cannot lose if God is on our side. No matter what people say or do to us, we cannot lose if God is on our side. This is why it's so important that we understand whose we are. David knew whose he was, and he could go into battle knowing God was for him. Don't discount yourself. Don't let yourself be overlooked and think, well, I'm only a wife. I'm only a mother. Well, I come from this poor family. Well, I come from the wrong side of the tracks. I come from this messed up family. My skin color is wrong. Don't let yourself be overlooked because God don't overlook you. God does not discount you. He does not overlook you. I say over myself every day because, see, it's a battle that I have to fight every day because of what's been spoken over me. And so then I have to put the word. What does the word say about me? Well, the word says that I'm an overcomer. The Bible says that I am the head, not the tail, above only, not the knee. I am victorious, that I'm more than a conqueror, that everything my hand touches prospers. I speak that every day over my life. And why do I do that? 
because the Bible says that about me. And if the Bible says that about me, it has to be true. It is true. Everything that's been spoken over me of my past, from my family, from friends, from leaders, from other people, it's not true. If it don't line up with the word, it's not true. And God does not over, um, overlook me. If I know what the Bible says about me, I know who God is and I will win every time. Simple. I will win. God created. He created you. He created me to be a masterpiece. I am a masterpiece for him. He needed me right now. He needs you right now. That's why you cannot discount yourself. That's why you got to stop saying I'm overlooked because you're not overlooked by God. He needs you right now. In 2017, he called you. He set you here. He didn't put you 200 years ago. He put you here right at this very given moment. And he did that. Why? He needs you. You have certain talents. You have certain gifts. You have certain abilities that you're to reach certain people. And so this is, this is your time to shine because he created you. He created me to be his masterpiece. There are certain people that only you can reach. And you have got, you got to feel that wide ready for you to go reach with the gifts and the talents and the abilities he's given you. Your life matters. My life matters. It don't matter what's been spoken over me. It don't matter what's been spoken over you. It don't matter who's overlooked us and considered us insignificant. We matter. We matter to God. And so I want to just finish up right here. First Samuel 17 verse 51. It says, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. Why is it so important that you get your breakout, that you break out because there are other people on the other side of your victory tied to your breakthrough. They need you to get your breakthrough because the victories are tied to you. It's tied to you not being stuck in the, in the past of what people have said and being overlooked in the insignificance their victories are tied to you. It's important you get your victory. Just like David, all those men who were fearful and scared were filled with boldness all of a sudden. And what did they do? They didn't retreat. The giants gone down and they retreated. What did they do? They began to chase these, these other Philistines. They began to chase them. And they experienced their own victory for the first time. All because David refused to be overlooked. That is why the victory was won. David refused to be overlooked. Your life does not have to be defined by the story you've lived this far. It don't have to be defined. And the last scripture I want to leave with everybody, I tell you, put it on your, your, your mirror, put it on your phone, put it by your bed, whatever you have to do on your refrigerator, meditate upon it, look at it, because this is what God says about you. Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things, the good things he planned for us all along. You are his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece. And when we've asked Jesus to come to our heart, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus for the good work that he's had for us all along. Let's go out and fight our battle. Let, let's let God fight our battle. But let's be willing to say, I'm here. I'm willing. Whatever, God. I will not be overlooked any longer. I refuse to be overlooked because I am his masterpiece. Thank you so much, Madison, for letting me come on with you this morning. Yes, I love that. And I love the one point you made about getting your breakthrough. Like, it took one person. Like, they had been out there for how long standing there? watching them mock their God, watching them do the thing. It took one man to change their entire circumstances. It took David being brave enough to stand up for what he knew was right, for what God had spoken over him, for who he knew he was. One person, one person changed the entire outlook of the battle, their entire circumstances. One person determined whether or not they would be slaves or whether that they would be the ones enslaving. One person did that, and that one person can be you. You're so right, Sonia. I love it. I love that. Well, would you close us in prayer? Would you just pray over mm -hmm. us today? Pray that we would just stand up and, and be who God created us to be and, and not, not be overlooked any longer. Absolutely. Okay. Father God, I thank you for, for these people that are watching today and, and that will watch us in the future. God, I thank you that we 
would choose to be people that's not overlooked, but we would be people that will walk into the, dis that the, the destiny that you have created us for, that God, that we would become the people that you have called us to be. We are people that are significant. You have a purpose. You have a plan, plan to prosper us, Lord. And I thank you. We know who we are and who we belong to, Lord. And so, Father, help us, strengthen us, to be everything that you called us to be. Strengthen us and help us to, to walk out the very destiny that you have called us into, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for choosing us today. Amen. 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 Thanks again, Sonia. We appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. You have a blessed day. You too. And everyone else, we'll see you back here tomorrow at 615. We'll be talking about holiness. So, See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.